Thank you. It is my birthday. I did just turn 25 <laughs> a long time ago. Um, I want to talk about stress and the impact of stress on the body. And at the end, we will be talking about some of the new uh, Purity Life products, particularly the ModuCare and the uh, new Kyolic products. But I want to put emphasis on the stress issue. Um, as, um, as we're being told earlier, I'm doing postdoctoral research on the impact of stress on the body, the physiological and biochemical impact of stress. You're being told um, that a lot of people have stress-related symptoms, whether they're gastrointestinal, whether they are muscular, whether they are respiratory symptoms, or immune systems, symptoms, etc. And what we have to realize is that though stress does play a role, there is a way and a reason that stress plays a role on those functions of the body. Those, those symptoms are not mental. They are very physiological and biochemical. And to understand them will help you help your customers either prevent, reverse, uh, or reverse the impact of stress on the body. And one point I want to highlight, and I'll mention it again as we talk uh, later on, but one point I want to highlight is research is showing, ours is showing that, another research is showing, that when people have had continued stresses, the body starts modifying the way it does things, and some of those modifications remain even when the stress is gone. So that somebody may no longer be stressed and may nevertheless have symptoms that were triggered by stress and are still associated by stress. And unfortunately, they'll be treated with anxiolytic medication, with antidepressants, with pills to help them sleep, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which don't solve the cause of the problem and don't address the biochemical changes that have taken place because of the stress. <clears throat> The book you have in your bag is called Syndrome S, and it's how to avoid, manage, and reverse the negative effects of stress on the body. And I think it's important as health food retailers for you to understand it because you are at the front line. And a lot of things I'm going to say are not necessarily new, but it's important to remind you of them. Um, and because our research is focused on stress, and because in the last 30 years of practice, I have found that more and more people are stressed younger and younger, it's important to understand how things work when we talk about stress. So stress is any physical, chemical, or um, emotional factor that causes bodily or mental tension. Not just emotional. We're talking about chemical, emotional, or physical factors that cause bodily or mental tension. And anything, any change that requires mental, physiological, or biochemical adaptation. And I'll give you an example. And I may mention this again later, but the percentage of women who suffer from stress-related anxiety, or the women percentage-wise, is significantly higher than men. It's not because you're weaker mentally or psychologically than we are. You're probably stronger than we are mentally and psychologically. My wife is here, so she asked me to say that. Um, <clears throat> but really, one of the reasons is that every month, you go through stress. What is stress? We're talking about biochemical change. Estrogen goes up in the premenstrual period and then it drops. Your body has to adapt to that change. And for the body, it is a stress. It's not an emotional stress. It is a hormonal stress, but it is a stress nevertheless. So women are actually have hormonal stressors that men don't have and on a regular basis, 12 times a year for many, many years. So any change that requires mental, physiological, biochemical, and I could add, Social or environmental adaptation, chemicals in the environment, whether they're pesticides, fungicides, herbicides, the various chemicals that we breathe and so on, are stressors as well because the body has to deal with them. It has to adapt what it's doing to be able to get rid of them, and so they do have a stress impact on the body. You've probably seen a study that was published uh, in the United States by the Center for Disease Control in uh, 2000, I think it's 2012, where they actually were able to draw blood from the umbilical, umbilical cord uh, in an about something like 2,000 pregnant women across the United States, and they found that 100% of them had perchlorates in their blood. Perchlorates are chemicals found in rocket fuel. Why? Well, because as planes fly over us, you know, you watch those nice white streams and you go, oh, isn't that cute? No, actually, it's chemicals from the, uh, uh, from the rocket fuel that is now in the air and is going to fall down and everybody's in contact with it. So that's the stress. It's a chemical stress. It's not just an emotional stress. So again, stress can be hormonal, chemical, immune, environmental, emotional, and physical. It's not just emotional. And bear in mind that research by Holmes and Ray and others have shown that the impact of stress on the body is cumulative. 
It's one stress and two stresses and three stresses and four stresses. And then that proverbial drop that makes the bucket overflow. Bear also something in mind, and we've seen this in our clinic more and more. When individuals have had a significant stressor early in life, child or adolescent, whether it's a divorce, whether it is uh, being molested, whatever the type of stressor is, their stress glands, their adrenal glands seem to be much more fragile and seem to react much more than an average individual would, everything else being equal, when as an adult they do start getting stresses. And if you have customers who've gone through this kind of horrible situation, you're going to have to try to help them to strengthen their adrenal glands as much as they can and to help the body deal or manage with stress more than somebody else would have to. Dr. Hans Selye, researcher in Montreal, talked about distress, the bad stress, and you stress, the good stress. And what Hans Selye was able to show is the body reacts the same way to bad or good stress. So somebody who's very fearful can lose their appetite. They can have difficulty sleeping. They're thinking about what scares them and it keeps them awake. And when they're confronted with what scares them, they can get all red and flush in the face with sweaty palms. Think of a young couple in love. They lose their appetite, at least initially. They have difficulty sleeping. They're all nervous, all giggly. Um, and when they're not confronted, but when they're in front of the person they're in love with, they get all red and flush in the face with sweaty palms. So the body reacts the same way to good or bad stress as well. And the body reacts the same way whether that stress is chemical, hormonal, or physical. What does it do? In 2014, like in the year 14, the body mobilizes itself to do one thing when there's stress, to fight or to flee. We are programmed physiologically for a response that we have had as humans as long as we've been humans, and a response for which we've changed our environmental structure and our social structure. You know, 200 years ago, if you had no food in your cupboard and you had no money under your mattress, you'd get stressed. Your blood sugar would increase, your blood pressure would increase, your skeletal muscles would get tight, but you'd go out and fight, or rather, you'd go out and hunt, um, or gather food, or you'd steal food. Either way, the response was physical. Today, our responses are no longer physical or very difficult to respond physically. Your neighbor makes noise at 3 o'clock in the morning, you get up, not very happy, your body's mobilized to take a baseball bat and solve the problem, but you're not allowed to. Luckily, if I'm the neighbor. Um, no, I don't make noise at 3 o'clock in the morning. So, the body mobilizes itself to fight or flee. It has not changed the way it does things, and yet, we have changed the way we permit the body to react. And that is one of the factors that causes havoc. Fight or flight response is there. If we don't fight, we don't flee. Bear in mind as well that in the past, though the stressors were probably significantly more intense than they are today, they were very limited in time. So let's say you're walking around in the woods somewhere and you're confronted with a saber-toothed tiger. Well, you'd try to run away. And if you didn't succeed, well, your stress level was over forever. Uh, and if you did succeed, you were probably intelligent enough to avoid areas where they had saber-toothed tigers for a while. So the stress was very intense, but might be short-lived. Um, you had no food in your village. Everybody got a little excited and, and stressed. People would go out and hunt. They'd kill this big animal. They'd bring it back. It's a lot of stress. But then there might be enough food for a week or two. Everybody would party until there was no food left, and they realized they have to go back hunting. So the stress, again, was a very intense stress, but there were periods of quiet and calm. Now, today, our stressors are not as great but they're like the Chinese water torture. Remember that? One drop, two drops, three drops, four drops, five drops. And stressors are higher and higher and higher and daily and continuous. Think about just driving here from work, if those of you who drove. Uh, think about having your iPhone uh, or whatever type of, of phone you have and always having to respond and text to people or thinking you have to respond uh, to people and look at your emails, etc. That's a major stress. And there are stressors, again, that did not exist 200, 300 years ago. If you're hungry, you've got no food, you can't go out and hunt and steal or gather. You can try again, but it'd be more difficult. So the stressors are smaller, but they are continuous, and the body does mobilize itself to fight or flee, no matter what the type of stress, and even small stressors. And the impact, I repeat, is cumulative. 
Once you've had one stress, two stress, three stress, four stress, there is a point where the body thinks it's almost always in danger and continues to be in a fight or flight mode even when the stress has disappeared. So what does the body do when it thinks it's in danger? Well, the fight or flight response is really simple. The body's going to increase any physiological or biochemical activity that is required for survival. Anything that would help you fight or flee. So it's going to increase blood sugar. And we do know that type 2 diabetes is directly associated in many cases with excess sugar consumption and in other cases basically with the fight or flight response with stress. According to the American Medical Association, 80% of type 2 diabetes have a stress factor involved. They don't say how. But one of the reasons is because the body increases blood sugar to ensure fight or flight. So if you're always stressed, the body's always trying to increase that blood sugar so that you'll have the energy to fight or flee. Unfortunately, you neither fight nor flee. Insulin resistance. Insulin resistance is an interesting situation where the body will actually produce a situation that will have a long-term effect that would have a short-term, a long-term negative effect that would have a short-term positive effect. Every cell in your body needs insulin to be able to use sugar, to uptake sugar in the cells, to break down fat, and to ensure the production of your own native proteins, whether it's your skin, your bones, uh, your neurotransmitters, your antibodies, etc. The only tissues in your body that don't require insulin to use sugar are your muscles. So when the body creates insulin resistance, most of your cells are lacking the capacity to use sugar, but your muscles have more sugar available because the other parts of the body aren't using the sugar. And it's wonderful if you could fight or flee. More sugar available for the muscles to ensure fight or flight. Unfortunately, again, we can't fight or flee, and insulin resistance leads to a variety of problems. Hypoglycemia is one of them. Insulin resistance leads to the difficulty in losing weight and particularly the accumulation of fat around the waist because one of the roles of insulin is to ensure the breakdown of sugar. Insulin resistance leads to type 2 diabetes, but even before that, it leads to difficulty in controlling blood sugar, with drops of blood sugar during the day, fatigue, having to eat, craving for sugar starch, um, difficulty in, in not eating for more than two or three hours, and so on. So insulin resistance can also lead to metabolic syndrome. We're talking about high LDL cholesterol, low HDL cholesterol, high triglycerides, high blood pressure, and so on. The body will increase blood pressure if it thinks you're in danger because as blood pressure increases, blood goes much more, more quickly to the muscles to ensure fight or flight and to the brain to ensure fight or flight. And so people may have high blood pressure and it may be due to the state of their adrenal glands, the stress glands, because they've had many, many stressors. Uh, greater muscle tension. There's an interesting study that showed that 90% of cases of fibromyalgia are triggered after a certain period of intense stress. Now, the people may no longer have the stress afterwards, but one of the phenomenon in fibromyalgia is that there is no inflammation. It's not fibromyositis or fibromyitis. It is algia, which means pain, fibro for fiber, myo for muscle. It says basically your muscles hurt. Um, and it's basically a diagnosis of exclusion. We don't know what you have, uh, but your muscles do hurt, so we're going to call it fibromyalgia. And in fibromyalgia, stress is a trigger, and one of the ways the impact of stress on fibromyalgia can be explained is by uh, greater muscle tension. Another area that is very paradoxical, but another area where stress can play a role is it's been shown that stress can actually increase the parameters of the immune system, decrease it in some areas, but increase it against its own cells. And so if you find, if you look at or talk with people who have autoimmune diseases, multiple sclerosis, Hashimoto's, uh, lupus, uh, etc., often they, they have the gene, but often the disease will be triggered when they've had a very important stressor. It's a drop that makes the bucket overflow. The immune system kind of goes a little crazy and start reacting to things it shouldn't react to in an excessive manner. And we'll see in a few seconds that food allergies and food intolerances are exacerbated, abnormal, and excessive reactions of the immune system to something that's not that dangerous. You know, a peanut is not that dangerous that a child should stop breathing when he eats it or she eats it. It's, a, it, it's an excessive, disproportionate reaction to something that's not that dangerous. And when the adrenal glands, the stress glands, are fragile, when the stress glands have been overworked, initially they become trigger happy and they overreact to things to which they shouldn't overreact, including allergens, foods, etc. 
Now, the other thing is the body will reduce any function that is either um, detrimental or not required for fight or flight. Serotonin is a really good example. We talk about it more in detail. But serotonin, as you know, is a neurotransmitter that helps us sleep. And research shows invariably in every single time that as cortisol, the stress hormone, goes up, or adrenaline, another stress hormone, serotonin, which helps to sleep, drops. Why? Well, if you're in a village that's surrounded by an enemy, it would be a good thing not to sleep deeply. You could hear the enemy if they break through the gates of the village, right? So as stress hormone production increases, the body reduces serotonin to ensure fight or flight. Um, it will reduce the uh, reproduction, reproductive hormones, which is normal too. You know, if you're running away from a saber-toothed tiger, it's not a good thing to stop and reproduce yourself. And you've seen this phenomenon probably a lot of times where after a certain amount of stressors, there's either a drop of libido or there's a problem with fertility. And you've all heard at least of one case of an individual or actually a couple that really, really, really want to have a child. I mean, it's really important. It's, it's extremely important for them. They can't get pregnant. When they decide that it's over with, they'll live without having a child or they adopt, they get pregnant. Stress decreases reproductive hormones, all of them. And in women, stress has a major impact because it significantly decreases progesterone. And bear in mind that there has to be a balance between progesterone and estrogen. And about 70%, ladies, of the progesterone you produce is actually produced by your adrenal glands. But the body uses the same amount of progesterone, or the same amount, rather, of material to produce progesterone as it does to produce cortisol in the same material. So if it thinks it's in danger, it's going to prioritize the production of cortisol, the stress hormone, and produce less progesterone. So stress can have an impact on premenstrual tension symptoms, on endometriosis, uh, and a variety of other estrogen or high estrogen level symptoms where the level of estrogen will be normal. So estrogen levels are normal, it's progesterone that's dropped, but if progesterone drops, even if the levels of estrogen are normal, symptoms like premenstrual tension symptoms, which nobody has here, of course, um, which, um, and, and other symptoms related to excess estrogen, endometriosis, et cetera, um, will increase significantly. And there'll be reduced growth or repair. Scientific literature, for example, has shown that the intestinal tract mucosa are damaged when there is a lot of cortisol, the stress hormone. And it changes the permeability of the intestinal tract. We talk about something called the leaky gut or leaky gut syndrome. Well, that's associated with stress response and cortisol in part. It's not the only factor, but it is an important factor. And what's being shown, and I don't like the term leaky gut, by the way. Your gut doesn't leak because if it did, fecal matter would get it into the bloodstream and you'd die. But the selective permeability of the intestinal tract is changed. And that's when you start developing food intolerances, food allergies, et cetera. Well, stress does have a role to play in that. And we could talk about a variety of other effects of stress. I want to highlight the research. Well, first of all, I want to mention that new research is showing that some of these changes remain even when the stress is completely gone. Number one, bear that in mind. It's really important. And number two, bear in mind that somebody can be very stressed physiologically and biochemically, but not psychologically. Because the way we respond to stress psychologically is in part due to our character and temperament, um, our philosophical outlook, our values, etc. So somebody may be actually relatively calm and zen psychologically, and their body may still be primed and reacting to stress nevertheless. And when you say to your customers, are you stressed, and they'll say, no, which means I'm not running around like a chicken that has a head cut off. But that doesn't mean there have not been those physiological and biochemical changes that have taken place. And yes, when you ask them, you know, when did this problem start? And they start saying, well, you know, when I was in school, I was kind of stressed and uh, I had to work full time and I had to study full time, etc. or whatever, you know that stress may play a role and there are things to do about it. Let's go back to uh, serotonin here. One point I want to highlight with serotonin is as serotonin drops, people start developing problems with sleep. A drop of serotonin can lead to anxiety, depression, gastrointestinal symptoms, you now know that about 80% of all the serotonin in the body is actually produced in the intestinal tract, in the gut. And, <clears throat> and so a change in serotonin levels can make the intestinal tract more reactive. It can cause gastrointestinal problems. Serotonin plays a role in the perception of pain. When there's enough serotonin, the pain message going to the brain is not exacerbated or excessive. When there's not enough serotonin, for a relatively small trauma, the message going to the brain can be, ouch, this hurts a lot. 
So there's a decreased perception of, or actually an increased perception of pain when serotonin drops. And there are often problems with appetite and weight associated with serotonin and its control of appetite and of the feeding center. So the effects of cortisol, the stress hormone of adrenaline, and the impact of stress on the body include reduced immunity. You all know of people, for example, who have cold sores. Cold sores come out when they're stressed, when they're tired, when they've burnt the candle by both ends. Reduced digestive capacity. I mentioned it earlier. Cortisol can modify the permeability of the intestinal tract. And when the body thinks it's in danger, when stress hormones increase, there's a reduction of circulation in the gastrointestinal tract. That's why we used to say to people in the past, if you eat a big meal, don't go and swim, you might get cramps. Well, why would we get cramps? Well, if you've got a lot of food in the digestive tract and you're playing around in the water, your body doesn't know you're not moving physically that intensely because you're in, not in, because you're in danger. It thinks you're in danger. Therefore, what's the area that's the least important? Well, the areas that are least important during fight or flight, well, reproduction and, and digestion are not that important if you're running away from a tiger. So the body will reduce circulation in the gastrointestinal tract. There'll be a reduction of digestive enzymes. A lot of your customers who have had a lot of stress and stress-induced symptoms probably need to have extra digestive enzymes. They'll produce significantly less, even a long time after the stress is gone. They may need to repair their gut. Herbs like marshmallow, substances like N-acetylglucosamine, which help to repair the gastrointestinal mucosa. Uh, L-glutamine in reasonable amounts would help a lot in those cases, and so on. I mentioned it earlier, food allergies and intolerances. Uh, any kind of reaction by the body during stress or when the stress glands are overreactive will lead to abnormal or disproportionate reactions. Again, a food allergy uh, is not justified. It's not normal that you stop breathing when you eat a peanut. It's not normal that you should develop an intolerance to uh, wheat, though some of our wheat does deserve to be intolerant to because there's too much gluten, but it's another issue. But the idea is that those reactions are not normal. And often they are a sign of an exacerbated and overreacted immune system caused by overreactive stress glands. So let's start with insulin resistance. The symptoms can include craving with sugar and starch. If your body's not using the insulin effectively and you're not taking up that sugar effectively, you're not using it effectively, the body asks for more. You know, if you eat a banana and your body uses 25% of it, you'll be hungry to eat four bananas compared to somebody who eats a banana and uses 100% of that banana. So uh, craving for sugar, starch, carbohydrates are a sign of insulin resistance. Cognitive problems, memory concentration. Your brain needs glucose to function. And when there's insulin resistance, it uses it less effectively because you're basically often in a hypoglycemic situation. So memory and concentration are affected. And new research is showing that either adrenaline or cortisol goes up, the brain's activities for sitting down and reflecting on something drop. Because let's face it, if you're really in danger and you have to run away from an enemy, stopping to reflect on a text is not that important. What's important is getting out of there ASAP. Fatigue, <clears throat> maybe not at his age, but, but fatigue is a major factor uh, or major symptom of stress response that exa is exacerbated for two reasons, basically. One of them is, again, insulin resistance uh, and the fact that your body doesn't use the sugar effectively and you're hypoglycemic. And by the way, this is important to bear in mind, when there is insulin resistance, the individual may not have low blood sugar. And so if they're tested for hypoglycemia, the levels of sugar may be completely normal, but the sugar's not being used by the cells. So we're talking here about a cellular hypoglycemia rather than a hypoglycemia in the blood that can actually be tested and verified. Uh, so fatigue can also be due to the fact that if the body is always in a stress situation, it's always tense, you're using up a lot of calories for that fight or flight, which you may not be fighting or fleeing, but you're still mobilizing a lot of that. Metabolic syndrome, we talked about it, but high blood pressure, high triglycerides, low HDL, cholesterol, high LDL, um, and insulin resistance can all be due to the impact of stress. Now, there's a whole bunch of other reasons for it, the quality of the diet, the amount of exercise you get or don't get, and so on, but stress does play a major role. Cortisol uh, plays a major role in the development of metabolic syndrome. And if you have customers who have metabolic syndrome, yes, your standard nutrients, whether it's chromium, whether it's your B vitamins, um, some herbs can be really, really useful, 
But until you've addressed the state of their adrenal glands and help those stress glands get better and fare better and come back to where they should be, you may not resolve that metabolic syndrome effectively or it may take a very, very long time. We talked about the drop in reproductive hormones. There was a study we were looking at that was done, that we're looking at in our research, that was done in Germany where a reproductive clinic basically decided to test cortisol levels, stress hormone levels, in women who had difficulty in getting pregnant where the man did not have a problem with fertility. And often men do have the problem, and we don't necessarily test men as much as we should when there's fertility issues. But, <clears throat> but that having been said, uh, they tested the, the women, and they found that in about 80% of the women who had problems with fertility, cortisol was slightly excessively high. So the stress hormone was higher than it should be. And it was a constant finding in about 80% of them, so it was a very important finding. We talked about the drop of serotonin. So serotonin, as I mentioned, is counterproductive for fight or flight. Elevated cortisol causes a reduction of serotonin, leading to serotonin deficit symptoms, whether it's insomnia, anxiety, depression, excess appetite, gastrointestinal symptoms, and an increased perception of pain. 99.999% of your customers who have fibromyalgia have problems with serotonin production. And there are a lot of things that can be done to help serotonin production. We'll talk about the impact of aged garlic extract, chiolic on serotonin, which is something a lot of people don't know about. But you've got 5-hydroxytryptophan, you've got Rolora that can have an impact on lowering SX cortisol and help serotonin production and magnesium, which is very important for that as well. Hypothyroidism. Hypothyroidism can be caused by stress for two basic reasons. The first reason, the most important is, Research shows that when there's a lot of stress initially, the thyroid becomes hyperactive. However, a hyperactive thyroid is wonderful because you're actually producing more energy to ensure fight or flight. Your metabolism is increased. But a hyperactive thyroid is a problem because it also leads to a breakdown of protein-based tissue. If you look at your standard endocrinology journals, endocrinologists will talk about autocannibalism when they talk about excess thyroid activity. So what your body will do if you're in hypothyroidism a lot, because your stress glands are overreactive, it's going to gradually lead into hypothyroidism. And a lot of people, and this is the other point we'll come to, but a lot of the hypothyroidism doesn't come out in blood tests. So there may be, there is a form of hypothyroidism that is standard. Your thyroid produces less of the stress hormones, T4, T3, or not the stress hormone, but thyroid hormone. And so the thyroid stimulating hormone is at a normal level. That's one type, and that can be tested in blood tests. What new research is showing is that when people have had continual stressors, receptors for T4 and T3 in cells are no longer receptive. It's a mechanism where the body seems to say, look, I don't want to have thyroid activity because I want to conserve calories and energy, and I think I'm always in danger, so I want to have actually low metabolism. It's going to actually reduce the sensitivity of cells to thyroid hormones. So your customers may get their thyroid tested, and the level of the hormones is fine. And yet the cells are not responding to those hormone levels effectively. And they start developing hypothyroid symptoms. Ridged nails, breaking nails, breaking hair, difficulty controlling their weight, uh, water retention, dry skin, constipation. Uh, very, very uh, difficult menstruations, and a variety of other hypothyroid symptoms. Again, they're being told it's all normal when it's not. And they may have your regular hypothyroidism that does come out in blood tests. So hypothyroidism develops to prevent autocannibalism. It also develops because the body wants to re reduce your capacity to use calories because it thinks it's in danger all the time. It wants to have and conserve calories for long-term periods of fight or flight. Fatty liver. In French, when people are stressed, one of the terms we use is ne te fais pas de bile, don't produce bile. Doesn't sound good in English, but it sounds really good in French. And, and the point here is that your liver has an incredible amount of work to do when you're stressed. It's your major source of reserves of sugar, glycogen. And so when you're stressed, cortisol goes up, your body has to mobilize that sugar from the liver into the bloodstream, convert the glycogen into glucose to ensure fight or flight. Now, you don't fight or you don't flee. Everything's got to be broken down again. The glucose has got to get converted to glycogen. It's got to be stocked back in the liver. So the liver's working a lot. And cortisol, the stress hormone, has been shown to be more potent 
in producing fatty liver than anything including uh, alcohol, than anything except sugar. So cortisol and sugar are two of the substances that cause the greatest impact on the development of steatosis of the liver or fatty liver. And those are two events that take place when there's a lot of stress. Blood sugar goes up, cortisol, the stress hormone goes up, you don't fight or flee. Again, the body, the liver has to manage all of this uh, and it leads to problems with fatty liver. I have a patient, it's kind of interesting, she's about 82 or 89, this is years ago. And she was told basically by her physician, you've got fatty liver, um, where, do you drink? And she said, of course, no, I don't. And she said, well, yes, yes, of course you do. Where, where do you put it? <laughs> what do you drink? No, no, I don't drink. And what they realized was that a fatty liver was developed due to stress. Her husband had died uh, in her arms. Her son uh, passed away in an accident with a very short period of time. She lost her house because her husband died and they didn't have any more money to pay for the mortgage and on and on and on. It was, it was very dramatic. But the point is, fatty liver or even any kind of liver dysfunction can be associated with stress and it's something you have to look at when people have problems with their liver that the stress glands and stress hormones may play a role. <clears throat> He's very surprised. Um, the other thing that causes secondary symptoms, but that are related to stress too, is the fact that cortisol or adrenaline cause significant losses in certain nutrients. Some of these nutritional deficiencies must be addressed with supplementation, and you have to increase the body's reserve because if there's been a lot of stress, the body's lost so much of its reserves that it'll never be able to cope or catch up on a normal diet. So gamma amino butyric acid, you know, GABA stabilizes brain activity and calms the brain. And of course, when you're in a stress situation, the body is very excitable, the brain is very excitable, and leads to an overuse of GABA, glutamine is used significantly by the muscles during stress response. So you lose a lot of glutamine, but glutamine is also important to repair the gastrointestinal tract, among other things. So you're losing glutamine. Magnesium is probably the nutrient that is the most lost during stress, and by far. And what's unfortunate is it's probably one of the nutrients that's the most depleted in our soils in North America. Between 1914 and 1997, there has been an 82% drop of magnesium in our food. Apples are one of the uh, examples that were used by the United States, food, uh, not the Food and Drug Administration, but the United States Department of Agriculture. There's been a significant drop of magnesium levels in lettuce, in tomatoes, and in a variety of other foods. Organic is not as bad, but there's still loss in the organic products as well because of acid rain. One of the roles of magnesium in nature is to act as a buffer to neutralize acids in the soil. And of course, with acid rain, a lot of that magnesium in the soil is used to neutralize the acids. There's less available for the plant. So huge depletion of magnesium. Pantothenic acid or vitamin B5 is crucial for the production of stress hormones. So if your body's producing a lot of stress hormones, it's using up a lot of B5. And one study showed, that, and a very large study, that the use of vitamin B5 or pantothenic acid was actually able to reduce a lot of stress-induced symptoms, including what's called the burning foot syndrome, that a lot of people get after chemotherapy, by the way. Uh, and the reason they get it is because there's a significant increase in neuropathic problems, neuropathy, uh, and part of it is due to the impact of stress. In this case, maybe not emotional stress, though they probably do if they do chemo, but it's a significant chemical stress on the body. Pyridoxin, vitamin B6 is lost. Tyrosine is lost in huge amounts during stress response, in great part because of its impact and its need for thyroid function. And finally, zinc is lost which is one of the reasons there's a major impact on immune function, it's not the only one. So those nutrients have to be repleted, they have to be given back to your customers if they've gone through any kind of important stress or a, a certain amount of regular stresses over a certain period of time. If you don't replete them from a nutritional point of view, diet is not enough. And in 2014, your average orange, if it's not organic, has about 10, 5 to 10 milligrams of vitamin C. So forget orange as a source of vitamin C and anything else. There is, for any of the nutrients, significant loss, and they have to be repleted. They have to be increased. Diet is not enough. Uh, and the example of magnesium, which we're researching on our study, is, is simple. Uh, cortisol, the stress hormone, increases the loss, or, and adrenaline actually, increases the loss of magnesium. The less magnesium you have, the more your stress hormones react to stress. 
It's a vicious circle. And if you don't intervene in that, you have problems. No, that's not a photo of me in the morning. <laughs> kind of cute. I don't know what I'd do if I had a cat like that, but that's another issue. So what does chiolic and chiodophilus, what do they have to do when it comes to stress? Well, I'd like to talk about one of the impacts that's not very well known about chiolic or aged garlic extract uh, on stress, and then we'll talk about chiodophilus and probiotics. Just a reminder, chiolic is not garlic. It's aged garlic extract. Grapes are not, or wine is not grapes. And high quality fermented milk is not milk. And chiolic is not garlic. Like wine and not grapes. I'm being very consistent. Um, the basic difference, as you know, is the aging. We'll go through this very quickly, but chiolic is aged for 20 months. It's organic garlic from California that's aged in California for 20 months. And during that 20 month period, there's a lot of chemical changes that take place in the garlic. There's a natural bioconversion, as there is if you do any kind of natural fermentation or aging process, that leads to changes in the garlic where it becomes aged garlic extract. You eliminate a lot of the harsh substances and it has a significant change in its therapeutic value. So number one, it's organically grown, naturally aged for 20 months. It's safe from six to 1,188 months. That's 99 years. I thought it was cute. Anyway, um, and there's over 715, actually we're talking about 725 medical or scientific publications on aged garlic extract on chiolic, making it unquestionably the best documented natural supplement in the world. And you know, we're not talking about stuff published in fly-by-night magazines. We are talking about things published by the University of Baden-Baden in Germany. We're talking about the University of California at Los Angeles, University of California at Berkeley. Um, we're talking about studies done at the University of Florida at Gainesville and universities around the world. So very, very serious. Now, we know chiolic reduces the risk factors of metabolic syndrome, and we know that stress has a major role in triggering metabolic syndrome. So it increases HDL, the good cholesterol, lowers LDL, reduces hypertension, reduces hyperglycemia, and reduces triglycerides, and all of those effects are documented. We do know that aged garlic extract has a major impact on immunity, and this is kind of interesting. This is from the University of Maryland's Medical Center, and here's what they say. University of Maryland's Medical Center, very serious university, aged garlic may help the immune system function better during times of need such as cancer. In a study of 50 people with inoperable colorectal, liver, and pancreatic cancer, immune activity improved after they took aged garlic extract for six months. Now, this is not Mr. and Mrs. Everybody. These are individuals with a significant and a radical, radically compromised immune function. Inoperable colorectal, liver, and pancreatic cancer. And for the University of Maryland's Medical Center to admit that and actually put it on their website is really interesting. Dr. Percival and her group did a study on aged garlic extract and they found that supplementing the diet with aged garlic extract enhanced immune cell function. Now this is an interesting study because often what you'll do is you'll take people, let's say placebo study, and you'll take one group with a placebo, one person with a chiolic, and one group has less cold, flu, blah, 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 blah. The question is, is it placebo, is it mental? And of course they'll always say, if it's a natural product, that it's probably placebo. In this case, they actually drew blood from all the patients and they found that there was a direct significant impact of aged garlic extract on increasing natural killer cell activity and delta T cells. And when they crossed over the group and they gave the placebo to those taking aged garlic extract, there was a drop in natural killer cell activity and in and the uh, delta T cells, which showed that there was, in this case, an objective parameter that could be measured, which showed that it wasn't placebo. So they reduced the risk of the cold, of the flu, um, and bear in mind that natural killer cells and delta T cells play a role in cancer or fighting cancer cells as well, which may explain the University of Maryland's comments on aged garlic extract. And in a world where, as you all know, we're coming to a point where we won't be able to use antibiotics very soon. Margaret Chan, who's the head of the World Health Organization last year, said that in a few years, if, things, if the trend continues, something as simple as a scratch can become deadly again because we won't have antibiotics to fight it. Well, what they don't know, of course, is that whether it's golden seal uh, or echinacea uh, or aged garlic extract, we do have tools to increase immunity. And 
we, the, the, the bacteria or the viruses have never been able to develop resistant strains to those. That having been said, again, in an area and in a world where we have all these new bugs, and we're even talking about Ebola, which I don't want to put in the same um, bag as, as, as H1N1 or the mad cow, but still, we've got to increase immunity. You've got to help your customers maintain that major increased immune function. It's very important. Age garlic extract preparations have demonstrated an array of anti-stress and anti-fatigue effects. I'll mention just a few, but this is one area we haven't looked at. It has been looked at, but we haven't looked at, and we haven't talked a lot about when we're talking about aged garlic extract. Gilles Fillion was doing research at the Pasteur Institute. You've all heard of the Pasteur Institute. It's the major microbiology uh, and immune infectious disease research center in the world, in France. Nobody's perfect. Um, and Fillion did a study at the Pasteur Institute, and they were doing the study on immune enhancement. They were looking at how aged garlic extract actually affect the immune system. And what they found was that individuals who had stress-induced anxiety and sleep problems were actually sleeping better and less anxious. And so Fillion accidentally found that aged garlic extract may affect serotonin release in the brain. Now, this was in 1990. So Fillion then reported that aged garlic extract may modulate, and I'm quoting here, may modulate receptors that bind serotonin, thus making more serotonin available. Now, cortisol, the stress hormone, actually reduces serotonin availability, and aged garlic extract actually has been shown to make more serotonin available. And I'm quoting him here again. He says, by making more serotonin available, aged garlic extract may potentially help to alleviate various pathologies resulting from its deficiency. Depression, panic obsessive compulsive disorder, schizophrenia, as well as enhanced systems such as the immune system. Now, of course, we're not talking about kyolic as being the only factor in treating that kind of a problem. You have herbs and nutrients that play a major role in diet and lifestyle. But that having been said, something we don't talk about when we talk about kyolic as a foundational supplement is its impact on stress-induced problems, including the reduction of serotonin. And by the way, one of the issues with serotonin and stress is that new research shows that if there's been a lot of stress, your cells don't respond effectively to serotonin anymore. So not only do you have to increase serotonin levels, you have to increase the receptivity of cells to serotonin so the serotonin will do its job. Garlic extract showed significant antidepressant activity, probably by inhibiting monoamine oxidase A and B uh, levels, and in interaction with dopamine, uh, and serotonin, et cetera, GABA, and so on. So the point here is, Aged garlic extract has been shown to have antidepressant activities. Probably, GABA maybe, maybe not, but probably because of its impact, which is documented on serotonin production. Kind of interesting. Dr. Magassi reported that aged garlic extract prevented stress-induced hypertrophy of the adrenal glands. Now, hypertrophy of any gland is a sign that that gland is overworking. It becomes bigger, it hypertrophies in order to be able to produce more of what it's supposed to produce because the body thinks it needs more because it's under stress. Well, the fact that aged garlic extract prevented stress-induced hypertrophy of the adrenal glands shows that it has a major impact on reducing stress impact. That's redundant, but it has a major impact on reducing the impact of stress on the body. Subjects who were given kyolic swam 82% and 90% of the time they were in water, whereas those not given garlic swam only 50% of the time. Huge difference. When kyolic was given to runners, runners ran longer than those given placebo. Control ran 929 seconds. Kyolic, people given kyolic, individuals given kyolic, not people, ran for 1,611 seconds, almost twice as long. One of the impacts, one of the reasons may be the impact of kyolic on oxygen. We know that it helps to conserve and preserve oxygen. And of course, oxygen is necessary for performance. But the other uh, area, the other reason may be, and it's now being speculated, is its impact on adrenal function. Another study showed that garlic extract accelerated recovery from fatigue induced by exposure to oscillation movements, chronic rope climbing, and prolonged cold stimulus. <clears throat> when we do research on stress, we cannot, and it's not ethical, do research on quote-unquote psychological stress. It's done to a certain extent, but so what we do is we use physical stress, 
rope climbing, oscillation movement, uh, prolonged cold stimulus. Um, in other cases, it would be significant change in altitude, significant change in, in an atmospheric pressure, and so on. Because the body responds the same way to emotional stress, to hormonal stress, and to physical stress, we use the physical stresses. In this case, age graduate extract showed accelerated recovery from stress, physical stress. And this is just a little note about fatty liver, um, published in uh, AFACB in 2010 where they found that diabetic mice that were given aged garlic extract actually did not develop fatty liver compared to the mice that were not given aged garlic extract. They weren't given placebo, they were given nothing because there's no placebo effect on mice. Um, but those who were given nothing ended up with fatty liver. The mice who were given aged garlic extract did not have fatty liver. There's, uh, in, during the aging process, when you produce aged garlic extract, the substance that's used to monitor and mark whether that aged garlic extract has been aged sufficiently is s cysteine So it's a marker, it's a standardizer marker of aged garlic extract. And s cysteine is absorbed about 95% in humans. There's a lot of significant absorption studies on that. So they've, they found that the hypothesis that um, s cysteine has a potential effect in treating non-alcoholic fatty liver um, well, again, shows the impact of aged garlic extract and chiolic on treating fatty liver. So what we've seen is that aged garlic extract does have a role to play in the metabolic syndrome symptoms, in the serotonin production, has a role to play in immune function, has a role to play in fatty liver. All areas that are damaged, worsened, accelerated, all problems that are accelerated when there's a lot of stress. We talked about serotonin, again, the very, very important impact of serotonin on the body. Brain levels of serotonin are regulated by the amount of bacteria in the gut. The first book I ever wrote is called The Probiotic Approach. It was in 19, I don't know, 84, I think, or 83. And, and, and of course, in 83, not a lot of people were taking, talking about probiotics. Um, it was not very popular except in the natural product industry. And you didn't have these yogurt ads where somebody's stomach is dancing and whatever uh, because they had so-called probiotics, and I did say so-called. Um, <clears throat> so we've, we're beginning to realize the incredible impact of, of good bacteria, friendly bacteria in the gut. And I was listening to somebody saying this afternoon, uh, you know, probiotics are great because research shows that probiotics have an impact on helping people lose weight. And it's true, in part because they have an impact and a very important impact on serotonin production, and serotonin controls appetite and can help to control metabolism. So the quote here uh, from a study published in the Molecular Psychiatry is these results demonstrate the central nervous system neurotransmission can be profoundly disturbed by the absence of a normal gut microbiota. Now think about our society and the use of antibiotics. Antibiotics are one of the major factors that cause a loss of magnesium. Antibiotics destroy good bacteria in the gut. You're helping people get stressed out of their mind when they're using large amounts of antibiotics, as a lot of people are still using, notwithstanding all the research saying we shouldn't. So impact of probiotics on serotonin. One study using chiodophilus was kind of interesting. Um, they did a placebo-controlled pilot study on probiotics and emotional symptoms. And it was published in Gut Pathology, which is a very serious journal. There was a significant decrease in anxiety symptoms among those taking the probiotic versus control. Imagine anxiety symptoms decreased by probiotics. The results led further support to the presence of a gut-brain interface, one that may be mediated by microbes that reside or pass through the gastrointestinal tract. When I started practicing, one of the books I'd written is a book on candida. It was the second book I wrote. And of course, we were recommending probiotics. And one of the things we found in some people was when they were taking probiotics, they actually slept better. And of course, our theory was, well, you absorb more calcium, you absorb more magnesium, blah, blah, blah. We had no idea of the impact of probiotics on the production of serotonin. Now we do. So I'd like to talk about some of the new products, and I will talk about the link with stress as well. Chiodophilus and cranberry extract. It's a new Canadian product um, that links the Chiodophilus probiotic with uh, Cranmax, which is a standardized, high quality, very, very protected, uh, we'll talk about that impact, cranberry extract, and almost 10 years of therapeutic use and prophylactic use in Asia, Europe, Oceania, and the US. 
several years ago, I don't know how many, eight years ago or five years ago, I was in uh, Finland giving a series of seminars uh, about the impact of probiotics and cranberry uh, to uh, retailers, to physicians, etc. And it was interesting that it was very, very well known there. There's a huge problem with urinary tract infections in Finland, uh, and they use both the probiotics and the cranberry extract with great effect. So maybe a reminder with chiodophilus. Number one, human strains for the best adaptation. Human strains are strains that will develop most effectively in the human gut. Other strains may develop, may not develop, we don't know, because genetically they're not hardwired to function within the gastrointestinal mucosa. They're stable at room temperature for better compliance. There's a, a recipe that says that efficacy, E, is always equal to, no, results are, are always equal to E times C. Results are always equal to the efficacy of what you recommend times the compliance. So you can recommend something that's really, really, really great. If people don't take it, you're going to get zero results. I remember when my kids were very small, I used to give them golden seal. They hated it with a vengeance. One of my sons actually admitted that when I gave him golden seal, he would keep it in his mouth. He'd go to the bathroom and throw it up. So compliance wasn't that great, even though the golden seal was very useful when I did give it to them. One of the advantages with a thermostable product and a real temperature stable product is people put it with their other supplements, they don't forget it in the fridge. And that's one of the issues that's interesting with chiodophilus. No refrigeration required. It's been shown to resist gastric acid. In control studies, the strains used in chiodophilus have been shown to end up in the gastrointestinal tract and colonize. And there's a sufficient quality to ensure colonization. I just want to mention something about the probiotics on the market and the new, I guess the new um, craziness in some cases about probiotics. When people look at a product like Chiodophilus or I'll mention another very good product, I shouldn't but I will, like BioK, you've only got two strains. If you look at a lot of products, there's five, six, seven, eight strains. Now some of them may be very, very good, but a lot of those strains are transient strains. They're strains that go through the gastrointestinal tract. They don't stick to it and don't colonize. And a good example is Thermophilius, which you have in a lot of products and which you have in a lot of yogurts. Thermophilius is a strain of bacteria that helps you write that you have 20 billion in a bottle rather than whatever. Um, but it's a strain that loves high levels of heat. Thermo for heat, philia for love in Greek. And Thermophilius functions uh, at about 120 degrees Celsius. It's great when you make yogurt because if you put Thermophilius in your yogurt, you can produce it at higher temperature. And instead of taking four hours to make a yogurt, you may take an hour. Or instead of making, taking six hours to make a good yogurt, you may take an hour. Because it can stand heat, it loves it, it reproduces itself at high temperature, and the yogurt is made more quickly. But when you take a bacteria that is thermophilic, or thermophilia, and you put it in the human body at 37.5 degrees, it can't survive. It needs to survive at high temperatures. So be very careful with strains of bacteria. It's nice that there be five or six or seven or 12 of them. In a lot of cases, some of those bacteria are either redundant or, in many, many cases, they're not really bacteria that colonize the gastrointestinal tract. So in chiodophilus, you have sufficient quantity to ensure colonization as well. It has been shown to adhere to the gastric mucosa to produce organic acids, antifungals, and antibiotics. The specific strain used in chiodophilus have done that. And the main strain is Algaceri, which you've probably seen a lot of new research out on. It's a strain that's been around for quite a long time. It's the, most, the best research strain, and it's the strain that's been shown to be the most viable through the stomach and into the gastrointestinal tract to be able to colonize and reproduce itself. And it's dairy-free. Well, Cranmax, as you all know, is a pure cranberry concentrate. A lot of clinical studies done on it. It's the most research clinical extract, or most research extract. And what's interesting is a lot of the actives in cranberry are destroyed in the stomach. And they're destroyed in the stomach in part, in the cranberry juice in part, and cranberry extract that are made from juice, because the fiber in cranberry actually protects the, um, the active ingredients from destruction or damage in the gastrointestinal tract. Well, what these people have done is they've developed a system called BioShield technology, which basically is that they've maintained those fibers that help to protect the, uh, the actives in the stomach. And so it protects the Cranmax as it passes through the digestive system until it reaches the lower gastrointestinal tract where it's better absorbed. Now, of course, you could drink cranberry juice. 
Uh, there's a lot of problems with the cranberry juice. Number one, a lot of the active ingredients are destroyed in gastrointestinal tract if you're drinking the juice rather than eating the berries. <clears throat> Number two, the majority of products on the market are either pasteurized or cold pasteurized. Everybody know what cold pasteurization is, right? Irradiation. The government of Canada has permitted companies to now write cold pasteurization, and you'll see more and more of it coming out. It's basically irradiation. Um, consumption is in large amounts. You'd have to eat, drink about a liter a day to get the impact you might have with a small amount of cranberry extract. The liquid product is less convenient than the powdered extract. And in chronic cases, the fresh juice will cost more than the, uh, the extract equivalent. And, and that has been highlighted in the Canadian Journal of Urology, by the way, which is kind of interesting. Urinary tract infections. And that's what I want to focus on when I talk about probiotics and cranberry. It's, it's interesting because many, many years ago when I wrote my book on candida, the two type of symptoms I saw the most often in women were urinary tract infections or, of course, yeast infections. And there is a relationship between the two and the way they work. It's the second most frequent kind of infection in humans. Not deadly. But as one patient told me once, when you have a urinary tract infection six times a year, it may not be, over a 10 year period, it may not be deadly, but you want to die. 80% of the women will have urinary tract infections in their life, 20% will have UTs, UTIs yearly. As some of you know, I had cancer at the age of 21, and, and the cancer was damaging and crushing my urinary bladder. And I had symptoms that resembled the symptoms of urinary tract infection for a year and a half like getting up at night every 45 minutes to urinate, taking 20 minutes to fall asleep, getting active, and on and on and on. So I understand the issues and the pain and the problems with it. It's a second cause of absenteeism at work for women, and it's a major cause of antibiotic prescription in women. And this is where urinary tract infections are in great part a vicious cycle, because antibiotics actually probably play a role uh, or set the stage for a lot of the urinary tract infections. Research, including research done in Finland, where they've done, again, a lot of research on, on urinary tract infections, showed that urinary tract infections are caused by bacteria in the stool. And the nutritional factors that reduce the quality of our intestinal microflora increases the risk of urinary tract infections. That's the use of probiotics, and that's why, though somebody may need an antibiotic when they're in a crisis situation, once they're off of it, they, you should use or you should recommend use of probiotics and cranberry over long-term to reduce, significantly reduce, the risk of redeveloping urinary tract infections. Urinary tract infections in women have exactly the same issue as with candida, vaginal candidiasis. Um, bacteria can migrate easily from the rectum to the vulvovaginal area. In candida, they'll stay in that area that's dry, that's moist, and that's dark. And other bacteria can actually go up the urethra and end up in the urinary bladder. We treat them locally with antibiotics, well, not just locally, internally. We destroy them locally, but by destroying all bacteria in the gut, we also destroy the good bacteria, and there's a greater risk that these pathogenic bacteria come back. They've got less competition if you destroy the good bacteria for food, for the environment. Um, and so there's a greater risk that they come back and back and back and back. In 90% of all cases of yeast infections that are recurrent, vaginal yeast infections, they're a source of the intestinal tract. And so you can use local products, uh, Canisten, et cetera, which is now very popular because it's over the counter. You're not solving the cause of the problem. The infection will come back and back and back. Consuming fresh berry juice as well as fermented milk products has been associated with an important reduction in the frequency and the severity of urinary bladder infections. There was actually a study done, um, published in the American Journal of Clinical, Clinical Nutrition, where they're actually able, with a group of women who were willing to be part of the study, they were actually able to reduce by 90% the incidence of urinary tract infections in women who had had, over years, recurrent urinary tract infections. So, whoops, that's not what I want to do. Okay. So the objective of Chiodophilus with Cranberry with Cranmax is to help to resolve this situation of recurrent urinary tract infections by working on the root cause, changing the microflora. We do know that Cranberry extract does two things, basically, in the gastrointestinal, on the um, urinary tract. Number one, it stops the bacteria from adhering to the mucosa of the urinary tract so they can be flushed out as urine is eliminated. And the other one is that it's actually been shown to be able to repair the mucosa 
of the urinary tract, which is very important. There's some herbs that help as well if your customers have had recurrent urinary tract infections, like marshmallow, not the candy, the root, um, like marshmallow and others, which help to repair the mucosa, but you also have to get rid of the bacteria. So cranberry extract, Cranmax, and Chiodophilus are an interesting tool in helping your customers who have the beginning or the onset of a urinary tract infections or who have had them and don't want them to recur. So that's one of the new products. The other one is Chiolic and Curcumin. Basically what curcumin does is it supports and it augments some of the effects of aged garlic extract. Uh, we know curcumin is an anti-inflammatory. It helps to protect the liver. Significant antioxidant activity. And we won't mention this legally, but it has anti-cancer activities as well. So the idea with chiolic and curcumin is for those customers of yours who say, I want curcumin, and those who say, I want chiolic, which one should I take? You can say, well, you can have both. In an easy format, uh, very high quality curcumin with a lot of activity, a lot of curcuminoid activity. Other new product, let me remind you about Moducare, as a reminder of Moducare. You know, Moducare is a patented blend of sterols and sterolins in their naturally occurring ratio. And this is important to bear in mind because it's a patented blend. Other products that claim to be the same cannot be. Uh, and what they've done is instead of having a ratio that can be relatively arbitrary. You may see some new product that will say, well, I've got a 25 to 1 ratio, and it's more potent, and la, la, la. I continue to think and believe that we make less mistakes by sticking to the way nature does things than by trying to improve on nature. And this is the natural ratio you would have if you're eating foods that contain sterols and sterols. So studies showed Modricare has been uh, conducted in you know, rheumatoid arthritis, HIV, immune function in general, et cetera. What's really interesting with Modricare is it's along with aged garlic extract, I would say, it's one of the only immune enhancing substances that can be used continually and that has a balancing effect rather than a crude immune enhancing effect. And this is important. So it's shown effectiveness in a variety of immune dysfunction disorders and it's been shown to be effective in stress-induced immune suppression. We are talking about stress and Modricare has been shown to be very effective in that. But again, the interesting thing with Modricare is you've got an immune balancing effect rather than an immune enhancing effect. Now the new product is Modricare, oh, wax tabs. So wax tab technology helps to ensure controlled or sustained release uh, of the sterols and sterolins and it helps to protect them from stomach acids. So you can take one a day dosage rather than having to take two or three Modricare throughout the day. Um, natural wax, solvent free, uh, targeted response or targeted absorption, and again, daily dose. So it's basically your very basic, well-researched, and very effective Modricare, but now in a format that ensures uh, targeted delivery and time release for compliance. So I've finished here. I